So the bits and pieces that, that I want to sort of have a quick run through during my piece of this session really are the headline question of, of when are you a solicitor? And I suppose if some of you or all of you were at the session, session number one, when the standards of conduct were run through, you will already know the answer to that question. How your role as a solicitor can interact with your personal life and if it does and when it does overlap, on what basis does it overlap? As I say those three categories, I think, are quite important distinctions to be made. The, the rules, the guidance, the advice, the information, which I can explain as I go along. So if we're looking at the, the rules, these are the, these are the things that the society says that all solicitors must follow. And as I say, it's, as it says there, rule B1 has 12 standards of conduct and rule B1.2, which is probably the most important one for what we're discussing here tonight, is trust and personal integrity. The underlined, highlighted and bold text have, are, are my emphasis have been added. That's not how it appears on the society's website. But what the society's made clear by this rule and what it expects of solicitors is that you are a solicitor, you are a solicitor 24 hours of the day, seven days a week. You're, you're not a solicitor nine till half past five and then you switch off and there can be no regulatory or disciplinary comeback against you. And that's not to sort of try and scare everyone. It's just to make, make you aware if you weren't already that essentially your conduct in your private and personal life can have an impact upon your professional life. And there have been a number of examples um, of how that's come to fruition over the past in terms of disciplinary proceedings. The most straightforward one perhaps is that for solicitors who from time to time themselves will get themselves into trouble with the criminal law and the criminal courts, if they find themselves with a conviction arising out of, of that conduct, the society becomes aware of that, that can be the basis and has formed the basis and will continue to form the basis of prosecutions in relation to professional misconduct. There have been, unfortunately, you know, I don't see a number as in there are hundreds and hundreds every year, but there are examples of that out there. It doesn't mean to say that all conduct will be of interest to the society, and I think that's where hopefully we can try and sort of remove some of the, the fear that might be out there tonight. The second sort of section of the society's rules and guidance section which we give advice on in the professional practice team is the guidance section. And this is where it all would become slightly tricky because the society has got its own definition, definition of guidance. What we refer to within the society and what's asked of solicitors in terms of guidance is what we call guidance with a capital G. This is guidance that you should follow. And if you don't follow, it could be the basis of a conduct complaint and you would have to justify your departure from the guidance that's issued by the society. That is a different and distinct definition from what I would normally associate pre my time at the society with someone giving me guidance. In general terms, if you ask somebody for guidance, you're asking them for their thoughts, for perhaps a steer, but the society is very clear that the, the, pieces, the pieces on the website that are under the heading of, of guidance should be followed and if it's not followed you're going to have to have a, you know, a pretty good reason as, as to why it wasn't. Much of that relates to unsurprisingly how you conduct yourself in a professional setting, how you conduct cases in a professional setting, how you conduct yourself with our solicitors in the courts etc. The things that you will come across in your day-to-day your -day working life but as we've seen in terms of rule B1.2 there's an element here where it extends beyond that and into your own, your own personal actings. So there is some guidance on the website in relation to public comments by solicitors, which I initially had put into, tried to put into a slide and realized it took up about three slides and would have made no sense to anybody watching this. Broadly speaking, it covers the professional aspect of public comments by solicitors. And that is to say, if you are going to say anything about your client's case in your professional capacity as a solicitor, make sure your client, number one, knows you're going to say something, and number two, is happy with what you're going to say. If you're going to call a press conference in the steps of the court, your client shouldn't find out about it in the six o'clock news, what we're sort of driving at there. 
your client has to give the consent in a professional capacity for you to speak about their claim, about their case. When you do speak about it, you should be careful who you attribute it to. If your client wants you to say, say something on their behalf, make sure that's attributed to the client. Otherwise, it could be taken to be your own thoughts, your own opinion, your own words. It's very, it's very careful when you're doing that to make sure people know who's actually speaking. If you shift that away from the professional into the, the personal capacity, once, once you're off the clock, your own comments are your own. Now, this is where social media comes into play. And I think we're at a time now where social media probably is one of the most important, if not the most important tool for advertising, making connections, how people find out about other people, particularly when you can't go and meet people face to face. People will, it's far, far more common that employers and prospective clients and just the general public can get access to what you think about things. But the way they get access to that is by you putting it up there. It's important to remember that what you're putting out there, number one, once it's out there, it really is beyond your control. However much you try to lock down what people can see, it doesn't it doesn't really take much for someone to hold their camera phone up to a screen, take a video, take a screenshot and post that somewhere else. So think about that before you put things out there, because whilst you might be putting it out there on a personal profile or a personal opinion, behind that, even if it's not immediately obvious to one reader, to another who knows you, they'll, they'll know that with you comes that badge of being a solicitor. And the reality of the situation is in relation to third party conduct complaints and that include third party conduct complaints include complaints taken forward in the name of the society is that you can be complained about for what you put out there and i say i was i was trying to think of potential examples of of you know that i could actually use in a, in a public forum which were actually slightly difficult my, my initial thought was to say if you happened to have prejudiced, racist, misogynistic views, the smart thing to do is not to share them. Because if you do share them, don't be surprised when you get hauled before the discipline tribunal. There's an element of it that says actually, because I'm a solicitor and I want the profession to be full of people who don't have those views, if you hold those views, feel free to share them because we want to find out who you are. We want to remove you from the profession so that what's left are the good honest, hardworking people who will uphold the solicitor badge from here on in. But it is about knowing that if you post offensive content in the public forum, even as a, you know, as, as an individual, you're an individual who is a solicitor. You just have to know that. The, the, the last point in terms of the, the, the personally call them there in terms of know the policy really refers to knowing the policy of your employer, but me talking, giving employment advice when both Jack and Simon are here would be rather pointless. So I will, I will leave them to discuss the, the, the aspects of the, the you know, employment law. Turning to, I think what I have to say was rather surprisingly caused a, a wee bit of a stir um, when it was published on the 3rd of December. And really what, was the, what kind of brought me to the, the attention of, of this particular conference would have been the advice and information that was posted up I would say it was caused a, a bit of a surprising stir for a couple of reasons. Number one, there was plenty going on in the world that was perhaps more newsworthy than updated advice and information. And the second thing was it was it was an update on what was quite dated information by, by road admission. This wasn't something new that the society had on its website. This was simply a, a refresh to bring it perhaps more, more in line with, with where we are now in terms of use of social media. So the purpose there wasn't to try and bring in some new regulatory or disciplinary stick to beat our members with. That, that really wasn't it at all. And it's important to note that this is advice and information for the profession. This is not saying you must do this or you must not do that. When it was reported by, by some of the press, it seemed to latch on to some idea that the society were saying that you weren't allowed to post at four o'clock in the morning. Otherwise, that would be a conduct offence. 
that's just not it's just not true. Advice and information itself doesn't have a regulatory burden attached to it. It really was about trying to put some things out there for perhaps those individuals or those firms who aren't particularly au fait with using social media about what it can be used for and the benefits, quite rightly, that it can bring to you as a professional, but also at the same time saying, if you're going to use social media, both professionally and personally, that can have an impact on how you're viewed by those who are reading it. So be smart, be careful about what you're posting up there. And, and really, it could be boiled down to that. It's not something that we're expecting everyone to know off by heart. It's not something that we expect everyone to implement in their in their day-to-day -day life. Some people will choose not to be on social media. Some people will choose to be on social media a lot. It really is about knowing where the pitfalls can be. I suppose the, the final part really is, is where to next for the profession in, in terms of social media. And it's, I think that's a quite a difficult question to answer. There haven't been many cases where solicitors' comments on social media have caused them a, a difficulty. There is one noticeable um, exception to that, which is not me picking on the individual concern, but that there was a decision by the, the SSDT of a finding of professional misconduct against a Mr. Simon Brown, um, which, excuse me, I'm going to check the date just to make sure I get it right. Yes, it's on the 4th of October 2019. That decision is available on the, the SSDT website. I see it's not me picking on this individual, but I do flag it up because in the context that we're talking about, I think it would be remiss not to say regulators, disciplinary bodies for professionals are taking this seriously. And it's not just solicitors. There are examples elsewhere in terms of the professional footballers in, in England have had difficulties for posting up what were deemed to be racially insensitive posts on their own social media. But rugby union players in both Argentina and Australia losing positions because their federations have, have looked at old posts to see what they've been saying and found that it contravened their, their guidelines and their guidance. There are other examples in the professional world where people are becoming more and more in tune to what's acceptable and what's not. And quite frankly, it was a joke between friends is not going to wash if it's out there in the public domain. There's one case that's actually, I could keep an eye on myself, that there's a, a police officer, Callum Steele, who's actually taking his professional body to the court of session, relation to finding against him for what he posted on a social media chat forum in relation to a discussion that was taking place regarding the, the, the death of Sheku Bayou. It was obviously a, a very high profile, um, unfortunate um, scenario for all involved, but he's actually taking the, the, his, his case to the court of session for a finding. And I think in, in an element of, because it's untested waters a lot of the time, we don't know exactly where the line is going to be drawn in terms of how far a professional regulator, how far disciplinary bodies should be delving into private lives. What I would say in the final thought on that, really, before I pass across to, to Jack and Simon, is don't make yourself the test case. You might prove, prove, be proven to be correct at some point in the future, but don't make yourself the test case. Then back to before, break it down to be smart, be vigilant, and just be aware of what you're putting out there. And quite frankly, you'll be fine. So I think that really sort of sums up where we're coming from from the society in terms of your social social media. We're all for it. We use it ourselves. Just be aware of what you're putting out there and, and who can see it in the future. And I'll obviously happy to answer any questions on that once Jack and Simon have had a chance to, to go through their piece. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Anthony. Um, as Anthony said, uh, please do feel free to pop any questions in the chat box um, and we'll get to those at the end. So next um, we have Simon Allison and Jack Boyle. So Simon Allison is a employment lawyer and partner at Blackadders and Jack Boyle is also um, from Blackadders and is a director in employment law. Um, both um, speakers are actually um, podcasters and speakers of hashtag employment lawyer in your pocket. Um, so just a wee uh, plug for them there to add hopefully some attendees to the 13,000 subscribers that they do have, I believe. Um, so over to you guys, please. 
Thanks, Ayla. Thank you very much, Leila. Just uh, please bear with me, guys, while I, I work out how to share my screen. There's so some pressure, Jack. There's some pressure. There's always pressure, especially when Anthony pulled it off so slick. That was, that was slick, Jack. There we go. Um, so, yeah, good evening, guys. Thank you very much for the intro, Leila, and also thanks for the invitation to speak um, to, the, to the conference this evening. Um, Simon and I are regularly involved in advising clients, both employers and employees, in relation to all different kinds of situation about employment law. But certainly since I've been um, practicing for the last 10 years, I would say from day one, social media was just kind of kicking off. So it's kind of been something that's been almost with me through my career, the development of the, the law in relation to social media. So that's what our presentation is going to be about today. We've kind of split it into two two parts. First part about a bit about social media, and then the second part, hopefully kind of dovetailing into some of the ethical considerations, uh, linking to some of the stuff that Anthony spoke about earlier. Um, so that's the plan. You want to follow Jack on Twitter. Jack's Twitter handle is at employer Jack. Do you want to spell employer Jack, Jack? <laughs> Get it right this time. Come on then. So it's E M P L A W Y E R J A C K. You, thank goodness. Well done, Jack. That was done from memory. I never that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So our presentation is two part. We're going to talk about, first of all, five tips and tricks to build up your following um, for social media, and three questions to ask yourself when using social media. I should say there's a handout which we prepared which they will email to delegates um, later on this week. Um, and that's a pretty comprehensive, um, really informational handout, isn't it, Leila? You're nodding, Leila, aren't you? Yes, it's good. Good. Okay. Um, so without further ado, let's go. First of all, five tips and tricks to build up your following. Jack? So our first trick would be to sort of choose the correct forum. So, of course, social media is a very wide, a wide um wide variety of different platforms nowadays and there's constantly more and more different kinds of social media evolving um, so you know have a think there perhaps which of the which of the forums is going to be most appropriate for 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 your needs so it, just for example in in the employment team in black adders i would say the large majority of our clients are are employers so maybe businesses limited companies partnerships, PLC, sole trader, whatever. So they would be our, our largely our target audience. And we've we've found that Twitter um, probably lends itself best to us reaching that target, target audience. Whereas compare that maybe with our colleagues in the private client department who, who tend to deal with individuals more regularly, maybe conveyancing or um, drafting wills and those types of lines of work our colleagues in those departments have, have gained much more traction with Facebook, where the users tend more to be individuals. So that's our first tip. Is I think to, good, another thing to talk about potentially is to ask, so if you get a new client, ask them why they chose you to have other lawyers, other firms, because again, we always ask our clients why they chose us and not of another firm in Dundee and Edinburgh, Glasgow. And, you know, we find 90% of people follow us on Twitter, which is good, um, and large percentage listen to our podcast too. So again, ask your clients why they make contact with you to work, whether it's because of social media or why, you know, what the reason is. Okay, next slide. Next slide <laughs> is... So um, the next slide should... Yeah, there we are. So here's some LinkedIn tips for you. I'd say Jack and I mostly use LinkedIn and Twitter to market ourselves on social media. Um, and so here's some easy tips for you to you think about on LinkedIn. So again, photograph, you know, use up-to-date photo, don't use your Tinder pick. Um, head and shoulder shot is fine, not a full body shot, I would suggest. A sensible corporate photo too. One of our peers, a ridiculous um, photograph of him drinking from a, a beer tap. Again, not the best tool to have. Have a professional photo if you can. Um, remember also to, you, to include a banner. So you see above my head, you've got a banner saying black adders. Again, that's a good thing to do if you want to market your firm. Um, next slide, Jack. Um, you want to also customize your URL. So on the next slide, you'll see 
Um, if you've got an old LinkedIn account, your URL has got probably your name and some numbers after it. Um, Jack and I have personalised our URL, so we've got Simon Allison at Employer Simon, which you can probably see in the slide. And that's a good trip because, again, that will direct people to your LinkedIn profile if you've got the words employment lawyer, or trainee, or your speciality subject. Um, so, again, check your URL. You've got a good handout saying how to change that if you want to, to make sure you do have your best URL if you can. Um, and, again, recommendation you'll see in this slide here is a new thing which you can ask for on LinkedIn. Um, basically, recommend, recommendation direct people to your profile and again you can ask for recommendation if you want to so uh, again i'm giving you a handout as to how to ask for a recommendation and basically ask for a recommendation the client or your contact sends you in draft form which you can approve reject amend that kind of stuff so again that's a good tip to try and direct people to your linkedin profile great stuff and then similarly just a couple of of tips um not that we're claiming to be qualified to, to give you any teachings on social media, but these are just We're based, again, on, based, on, <laughs> based on our experience. Um, so again, similar to LinkedIn, you know, choose, choose a photo. Um, if you're new to Twitter and you set up an account, you'll see that the profile picture originally is like, a, it's kind of like, looks like a boiled egg. So <laughs> unless that resembles you, um, maybe don't use Humpty that. Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty would have that profile. Humpty like Dumpty. An egg. Like, like the, um, it looks a wee bit like the Maddie McCann initial um, mugshot, if anyone's ever watched move, that documentary. Move on, move on, Jack, move on. Move anyway, on. moving on, you'll see there that you've got to have somebody's name. So, for example, we've gone with Employer Simon and Employer Jack, which is what our name is. In in relation to your, you can put your full name, but you can also put kind of like a, a catchy handle as well. So for Anthony, um, Anthony McFadden. An option for you, Anthony, you could post at the real Tony McF. That would be available for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, the real Anthony McFadden is, is just a little bit too long. So sometimes you have to be a little bit creative there because Twitter limits you to 15 characters. And again, similar to the LinkedIn tip, you can put in your biography, use 160 characters to blast away there, your location, so, for instance, you know, where are you based? Where do you operate? If, you, if you're in a firm that operates in multiple locations and you want to make that known to your target audience, then, again, you can do that. And you can use it as an opportunity. You can link in your firm's website to drive traffic there if that's something that you want to do. And there's another nifty wee tool on Twitter whereby if, if you post a tweet um, and towards the bottom right-hand corner of the tweet, there's a set of dotted lines. It's like a graph, so, isn't it? It's kind of a, a set graph. of three lines. Yeah. And if you click on that, that's that's called your Twitter engagement. So that sort of that could be useful, a wee bit of sort of analysis that you can do yourself. You don't need to pay anybody to do that for you. And it just lets you see, for example, I think we've maybe got a slide um, about that, or maybe not. Maybe later on, there's a slide that lets you see you know, for example, how many people have viewed your post? It lets you get a gauge for what's, you know, what's well received and what's gone down like a lead balloon. It gives you kind of the tweet, tweet activity, number of impressions, total engagements, profile clicks, likes and retweets, which is um, excellent. So that's tip one. Um, tip two, don't just post about law. Um, and I'm not going to go <laughs> what Andrew said already, but, you know, we find that our most engaged tweets are things which aren't related to the law. And we operate um, back, we operate the 7-3 rule, um, whereby um, every 10 tweets, three should be related to the law and seven should be unrelated to the law. And that, we find, gets the most engagement and most um, Twitter impressions, I suppose. Um, so that's the 7-3 rule. For every 10 posts, three should be about the law, seven should be um, about non-law stuff. Um, as you can monitor things on Twitter, um, and this mon the impressions monitors not only the number of times the post appears in someone's feed, but also the number of times the post being viewed by someone who doesn't follow you. So you'll see in this slide here, I did a really riveting, riveting article about for the Scotsman about some nonsense about um, the lottery or some kind of 
The question is, what do a Kindle, a year's supply of ice cream and an eight-year-old dog have in common? Read my blog in Scotsman. So that was a pretty innovative um, title. And that got 2,000 impressions. That means that 2,000 people looked at, looked at my link, clicked on the link and saw it. Compare that with the next one. Um, the seven three rules. So here's a tweet I've done about my dog. Um, I'm doing this thing just now, which is just nonsense, some would say. But again, I do this thing called Film Friday, where I do a picture of my dog in some well-known-ish film. So again, did a tweet um, last month. Um, ladies and gents, this is the moment you're waiting for. The penultimate Film Friday, and that got a massive 8,000 impressions. So again, compared to the last one, 2,000 impressions for a, a law-based blog and then 8,000 impressions for that dog-based um, <laughs> post. So again, that speaks volumes about kind of how you want to kind of engage, I think, with your Twitter followers. So that covers tip two. Great stuff, Simon. Moving on to tip number three. Um, so again, this is linked to Twitter. Use photos and videos if possible. So I think, what's the average lifespan of a tweet, Simon? How many seconds? Seven seconds. Seven seconds. So again, you know, bearing in mind that um, people may be scrolling through Twitter on their phone if they're, I don't know, if they're on a commute or something like that, where they've maybe got a short, short window of time. That you know, the, if you you could craft a really good blog like Simon did on the previous slide, but if you just post it with text, then the chances are it's maybe less likely to get noticed by 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 the everyday punter scrolling through Twitter on their phone. So what? What we've always been schooled to do is, is to you know make use of photographs, images, or or even videos or gifs, something like that that you can you can accompany with your tweet, just so that it maybe catches the it catches the user's eye and gives them something that they maybe see the picture, they stop and take a minute to look at it, and it sort of enhances the, the likelihood that they'll maybe then click on and, and read your blog or your, your very interesting article that you've you've drafted. Um, <laughs> So that, that's what we're saying about tip number three. And actually, go back to the last slide, Jack. So we filmed this ridiculous um, video um, last year, um, kind of clearly breaching all kinds of IP rights. But um, we did this video, which you'll see there. Um, if you type in, in Google, um, E-L-I-Y-P, which is plug on your pocket, friends, um, then you get this video. And we did this kind of... Um, shockingly um, bad video of the introduction of Friends. Um, Jack played, who did you play Jack? Can't even Dan remember. And I played Joey, in any case, have a look, you like it, it's, uh, it's very um, informational. Okay, so tip four, um, consider podcasting again, there are lots of great podcasts out there. The Scottish Young Lawyers Association got a podcast, which is really, really um, interesting, really good. Um, our view is to limit podcasts to 10 to 15 minutes max um, I know the Scottish Law Young Lawyers Association need to give longer podcasts, but our view is kind of the lifespan of a, a general adult attention plan is up to 20 minutes. So again, given the fact we, we tweet it or we post about the law, we try to make our podcast relatively short. So we make it kind of a 15-minute podcast, uh, which is kind of, we find that gets better traction in terms of engagement and um, retweets and that kind of stuff. And again, we always set a fixed number of podcasts to avoid fatigue from us and the listeners. So we do a, a series of eight podcasts in one season, which means, you know, you start off episode one, two, three to eight, and that kind of, you know, that avoids fatigue potentially. Um, I mean, we were, when we started podcasting about uh, three, four, five, ten years ago, Jack, when was it? I think it was four, Any case, four, four years. years ago. And um, we were told by a, a podcast expert, if you manage to get 150 subscribers, their first season, that'd be amazing. We managed 800 for the first season. And now, as Leila said, we're up to 13,000 subscribers. That's amazing. On to season five, so it's great. If you order a podcast, make sure and do a call to action. Lots of people forget to do that. You want to have a call to action. You want to ask the listeners to potentially rate, um, you know, your podcast on iTunes. Um, ask them to, you know, subscribe to the podcast. You want to end your podcast with a call to action. Okay, and that assists with search visibility and direct other listeners to your, your podcast. So tip four is to consider podcasting. Great stuff, Sai. And last tip slash trick number five is just be individual and not generic. Um, so, you know, again, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Insta, TikTok, whatever you're using 
to drive your business and business development, networking opportunities. You know, at the end of the day, as, as people always say, people buy from people. And so it's an opportunity for you to demonstrate within, of course, the confines of the of the Law Society guidance, capital G, that um, <laughs> you can be individual and you can, as long as your true personality isn't infringing any of the, any of the, um, you know, the things that will come on to in the second aspect of this talk, then it's a good opportunity just to express yourself and let people get an insight into a little bit just about yourself so that they can feel. People often, people often think that they know us because they see us on Twitter and they kind of see us post a bit. People think they know us. They don't know us at all, Jack, do they? Not at all, no, but it does, it, you know, it's a useful icebreaker, none, if, if nothing else, if you happen to meet somebody, maybe you meet somebody at a, a conference, a legal conference or an event, you know, it gives them an easy in to start chatting to you and say, oh, yeah, I know you from Twitter. Your tweets are great. Um, and or not. <laughs> not as if the honesty was to prevail. <laughs> okay. By the way. Yeah. Okay. So, again, the second part is three questions to ask yourself when using social media. Um, so, question one, does my firm have a social media policy? So, our advice to clients is does in respect to this of course is that your firm should have a social media policy in this day and age and of course you know that kind of developed long from a little bit of employment tribunal case law in the early days of facebook and stuff like that employment law hadn't quite caught up with the developments in technology so for example there was a lot of employers who were maybe disciplining and dismissing employees for for saying offensive, discriminatory, reckless things on, on social media, but the employer hadn't set in place clear expectations or clear guidelines. So the staff were a little bit like, well, we're not clear what we can say and what we can't say. And there's quite a lot of the early cases that were found to be people got dismissed and then they challenged us at employment tribunal and it was found to be an unfair dismissal because the employer didn't have a social media policy. So that's the first tip, you know, get a good social media policy in place or if you're looking to dip your toes into the water of using social media for your your professional life make sure and familiarize yourself with your own firm's policy as well as the you know as well as the information available from the law society for example are you allowed to tweet personal stuff or does it all have to be blogs business related stuff um, generic stuff that you that you that your firm lets you tweet. Another illustration of that. So, for example, a lot of social media policies that we see will will draw a distinction between, on the one hand, an inappropriate post, and on the other hand, maybe an un unauthorized post. So, an illustration of what might be an inappropriate post. I could go onto Twitter and say, "What a." bleep day at work. Simon Allison is a bleeping bleep and I wouldn't mind panning his head in with an axe. So not at all how I feel, but that's just a stupid example of what would be an inappropriate post. Compare that with this example. What if I was to tweet? Great to see Blackadders merging with my family firm Boyle and Co. Another day, another merger, smiley face. So again, on one view, that second tweet sounds a little bit innocent. There's nothing offensive in, in that post, so I don't think it would be... Actually accurate, isn't it? It's factually accurate, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. It's factually accurate. But nevertheless, it could be regarded as an unauthorised post with, within Blackadder's social media policy. And the reason for that is we, we've got a thing in our policy that says anything that's, you know, top secret, newsworthy, something that maybe Blackadders want to do a press release about, for example, a, mer a merger with another law firm, the sort of the first dibs for tweeting about that go to the Blackadders branded account. And so if an individual is to, you know, sort of let the cat out the bag before the firm has announced the news, that, that would breach the policy as, a, as an unauthorised post. Does that make sense, Si? That does. So definitely an inappropriate and unauthorised tweets or posts. Um, so question two, is my tweet offensive, derogatory, close to bone or otherwise inappropriate? Um, and as Anthony says, in our profession, we're blessed with various ethical duties. 
Um, we must act professionally with integrity and must not act in any way which would be in professional disrepute. Um, social media, as we know, is an area which could potentially fall foul of this, um, this guidance, small g, big g. Um, in 2017 in England, it was a bad year for um, the Law Society. There were 130,000 lawyers who received law warning letters from the regulator concerning social media posts. Um, many of them were on personal profiles. Um, in fact, 2019, um, a lawyer, Mr. Paul, was rebooked and fined £1,500 by Solicitor's Regulation Authority concerning various social media posts. Many of the posts which he tweeted or, or made could reveal confidential information. For example, naming the police station or prison where we were meeting the client, also disclosing the nature of the charge in which he was advising. Um, in this case, Mr. Paul had a total of 130 posts which were all examined and found to be inappropriate or puerile. Um, examples include, he posted something like, um, attempted murder at location, followed by a couple of crying laughing emojis, not the best. Um, again, he posted um, domestic violence, dot, dot, dot. Christmas is coming up, what do you expect, law? Okay, so again, not the kind of thing you expect a lawyer to post. Um, and again, the last thing he posted, which I want to give an example, um, he says, drugs. When someone asks him what kind, he says not from the pharmacy, that's for sure. PMSL, what stands for, Jack? I think it's it. Pissing myself, laughing. Yes. So again, that was inappropriate, clear. So again, if your tweet is offensive, derogatory, close to bone, or otherwise inappropriate, do not post. And then moving on to the third question to ask yourself um, when making a post or making use of social media, and this is one that's relevant, especially to Simon and I as employment lawyers, is, is my tweet discriminatory? So, so part of a large part of our, uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is giving advice about, um, about the Equality Act, which provides that it's not, um, or rather it's unlawful for an individual to be treated less favorably or to be harassed or to be victimized based on certain protected characteristics things such as there's nine nine of them in total and um, they include things like disability race religion or belief gender i'm not going to list them all because i don't know them all off the top <laughs> of my head <laughs> and i should but so just again that's a common theme with a lot of the really inappropriate stuff particularly for us as as lawyers with with the ethical duties that we have a couple of case examples so in 2018 there was a senior partner at a law firm down in Yorkshire. And this lady was very experienced and she was also the firm's compliance officer, which I think made her actions even more concerning. And she, and she was suspended for 18 months in relation to some posts that she tweeted, which were offensive towards certain religions. Now in one of her, one of her posts on her, on her Twitter, she said, women must carry pepper spray learn self-defense and do everything necessary to rid the world of Islam. And another comment when she was addressing Muslims, she said that they should be put into a work camp to educate them or get rid. So she's clearly a delightful lady and, and she also laid into, she laid into Jews and Catholics. So really some pretty serious, you know, as Anthony said, the types of views that if you do hold those views maybe better keep, in, keep them to yourself, um, otherwise problems will arise. And in this instance, the Discipline Tribunal found this, this um, partner to be lacking in integrity and causing reputational damage to the profession of solicitors. And of course, closer to home, there was the, the example that Anthony touched upon in his presentation, which I think revolved around some tweets making reference to orange walks or orange marches in a manner which was considered to be discriminatory, sectarian, derogatory, and offensive, and which, which crucially were capable of bring, bringing the profession into disrepute. So that's the third question. Is my um, tweet discriminatory? And if it is, probably best not to post it. Good. So that concludes our presentation this evening. Um, the next slide, I think, is just our plug for our podcast. John, do you plug the podcast, Jack? Yeah, I would suggest that um, our podcast is short and snappy, keeps them happy, 
we're on a little bit of a break at the moment, which has been enforced by the lockdown. However, we do we do podcast about legal topics and we try and keep them as, as lighthearted. We try and strike a, a healthy balance between fun and, and um, information in our podcasts. <laughs> so please do subscribe if, if you're interested in learning more about employment law. Good stuff. Stop sharing, stop sharing my screen now, Leila. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much both to Jack and Simon. I would really recommend uh, their podcast to everyone. Um, as they say, it's quite short and snappy, so it's definitely worth um, the time. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers tonight. Uh, there's definitely a lot there. I think all of us could take away for our own social media and certainly also for the SYLA um, social media as well. Um, as well, just to let people know, um, we do have a few connecting trainees uh, networking events coming up. So as Anthony was saying earlier, you know, obviously with the virtual world going on right now and the lack of networking opportunities, that's quite a good opportunity um, that presents itself uh, the week after next. So if anyone's interested, uh, please do sign up to that. Um, so I don't know, I think we possibly have a, do a question um, in the chat box. So just two seconds. Oh, the question here. Um, the question is, what are your views on the Ryan Beckwith Freshfields SRA Oblique High Court of England decision? Is that one for Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think this even is, that, that, that decision kind of leads into the where, where do we go next in the profession? Um, there's a lot of discussion taking place right now, I think across a, a number of different professions as to how far regulators should go in terms of being moralistic in their approach and being, and being the morals police as to whether as to being regulatory and, and having their impact in terms of their prosecutions for disciplinary matters. My, my own view, um, and uh, see, I have to say, you know, this is my own view, not the Law Society's view. I don't, I don't speak for Law Society on, on their views on, on those types of matters. My, my own view was that there was, a, there was a case to answer there and that the prosecution was, was done in, you know, essentially, you know, for lack of a better phrase, in, in good faith. I think the decision in relation to the prosecution and the criticism that they've come under does change the picture. And it might be... A, view differently should the same set of circumstances come up again as I think as, as the picture the landscape existed prior to that prosecution there would have been criticism for the SRE for not taking that forward when some of the allegations were, were quite so serious um, but I think having, essentially having been told what they've been told by the courts they, they may take a different view and it's important probably you know, perhaps a milestone that's perhaps too you know too great a word but certainly a a point of reference for other regulators when, when looking at taking allegation, you know, those types of allegations forward under the regulatory framework. So, so I don't know if that quite answers the question, but it does feed into, I think, you know, the watch this space element for, for where proper regulation of, of personal conduct will, will end up as far as, you know, the Scottish profession and, and other professions will end up. And I, I think that, well, I say the, the second question there, which is, what, what effect might the recent JR decision in BC and others have on lawyers? If memory serves me correctly, and I might be going completely off tangent, that's the decision, I think, in relation to the police officers in the WhatsApp. Yeah, I think it is. Where essentially the WhatsApp chat, a private WhatsApp chat, was effectively stumbled upon in relation to a separate investigation um, and those officers' mis misconduct were was I suppose, highlighted and allowed to be admissible um, by the court, given that the police officer's special status um, within society. I would like to think that, you know, as a as a solicitor, that in a sense we enjoy that special status as well as trusted individuals, officers of, of the court. So I think it, it just is another example of almost what you think will be, you know, from my perspective, it's another example of what you think might be private one day you can never be sure is going to remain private forever, which is, again, just that think what you're putting out there. Now, it's arguable, you could say police officers were unfortunate in as much as they weren't posting up on 
you know, LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, they were having a conversation between what they assumed would always be a private conversation between colleagues, but at the same time, it existed out there in the ether. And whether or not you believe them to be unfortunate or unlucky, I think it just does serve as a warning shot to say, think about what you're think about what you're putting down there, think about what you're putting out there in any in any form and in any format there may be consequences. I think that's really what my takeaway is from that one. Totally. I mean, it's so easy for a, a person to screenshot their WhatsApp chats on their phone, isn't it? It's so easy yeah. nowadays. So, um, yeah, I think that's um, something to be careful of. Um, here's a question. Um, would you advise against writing about your personal political opinions on social media? Um, well, yeah, I, I, I think I try and avoid positive can. Um, on Twitter as well, Jack, don't you, Jack? Yes. Yep. No, I'm. I'm. Uh, I don't have any political opinions. I'm not into politics. I'm not ashamed to admit that. It's not something that really interests me. So, but if I did have political opinions, particularly maybe extreme ones or that, given the profession that I've chosen to enter, I would. I would be keeping them for discussion with my own family and in the four walls of my own house, and probably wouldn't be posting them onto the. To the internet for for everybody to to see. Yeah, yeah, I would I would I would echo that, Jack and Simon. The say that it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a, a discipline issue with somebody writing a, a political blog as long as it was you know you know not an attack on somebody else that went too far. But as I say, I, I think you you know, from an outside looking in, you, you think about it, you, you you may alienate some potential clients who you don't share your political opinion. You know you. There's no need for that. I'm with, I'm with you too. I, I would, I would keep that opinion. You say close hold. Yeah. Another question comes in. Evening. Thank you, to Anthony, Jack, and Simon, and Leila for this evening. My question is to Jack and Simon. On list of platforms to choose, a major omission was YouTube. Whilst there are exceptions such as Legal Eagle and Eve Cornwell that utilise it and have gathered followings, why don't you think firms? maybe don't utilise it as much. What are your thoughts on this platform for promoting content professionally and personally? Um, yeah, actually, we've got a YouTube account in Black Arrows, which we occasionally um, post from. Um, mostly it's just trainees talking about their experience to date um, and some, I mean, I don't know, maybe it should be publicised more often on YouTube. What's your view, Jack? I mean, I've, I know that the, you know, the, the legal... The legal eagle is that is that the one that you spoke on Simon or is that hey legal is that I hate YouTube. hey legal I lose track I mean I've seen some firms posting on YouTube and I, I, um, the, the posts that I, that I, that I observed the, I think you're looking at something like 50 views or 100 views not convinced it's not something that I'm sure I'm sure there probably is scope to make to make use of YouTube for, for lawyers um, and, and somebody will probably tap into that market. Um, but it's, it's not something that I've, I've, I've witnessed having been done successfully to date. Um, certainly from, as Simon says, from within Blackadders, it's, it's not something which we've been able to utilize yet, but hopefully for the future, who knows? Perfect. I think that's all of our questions um, at the moment. Um, if anyone does have any other questions, though, please do feel free. Um, hopefully the speakers won't mind me saying, um, you know, if you want to get in contact with any of them, if you do have a, a burning question, um, then please do. Um, just wanted to say um, thank you um, for everyone who did attend the first session. Thanks for filling in the feedback forms. And actually that that made tonight um, made us um, do a few changes for tonight so that was really useful and um, so we will be sending those out again after today as well as the handouts that Simon and Jack mentioned as well and um, so thank you again to the Clark Foundation for sponsoring tonight and um, as well as our speakers who have clearly put in a lot of time and effort into their presentations and uh, thank you everyone for attending as well um, and hopefully we'll see you at the final session of our ethics conference next Thursday thank you everyone Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Leila. You're welcome. Thank you. And cheerio. <laughs> cheerio, everyone. <laughs>